We've done it! We've finally reached 7,000 subscribers! Thank you, thank you all! And to show you our appreciation, we're gonna cover what you've wanted us to cover for quite some time, the Dark Age of Looney Tunes. This was kinda difficult because I had to watch a lot of mediocre cartoons, and in a weird way, that's almost worse than watching a bunch of bad cartoons, because you can watch something like Tipping the Rift and go, wow, this is atrocious! and you can actually hate it. But with a lot of these, there's no emotion to be had. No positive, no negative, no anything but neutral. And neutral gets really boring sometimes, trust me. So here we go for our 6,000 subscribers special. We're gonna discuss the dark age of Looney Tunes. Ever since Looney Tunes started, they were always gigantic hits. They were aired before movies a bunch of times, and people would sometimes even go to movies just to watch those. Even then, there was a strong fan base for them, but it wasn't made to last. The 1960s brought a whole bunch of new things to America, and one of those was the popularity of television. Televisions had been around for a while before that, of course, that's one of the reasons why Dwight Eisenhower won the presidency, but it wasn't super common up until now. In the 1960s, it seems like every single household had to have a TV set. People would discuss the shows more, they would watch them more, they would consume more of the commercials. It became basically the mainstay of American entertainment, surpassing the radio and the movie theaters. This caused the downfall of Looney Tunes for a number of reasons, actually. First of all, a lot of the old Looney Tunes cartoons were being aired on TV in shows like The Bugs Bunny Show. Even if they were in black and white, people were still able to watch them basically whenever they wanted. If the show was on, BAM! They could watch Looney Tunes and not have to spend however much for a movie ticket. That and theaters were also showing them less as well. They weren't showing them in front of movies or behind them or really anything anymore. So with Looney Tunes being ordered less and less and being shown on TV for less money more and more, Warner Brothers decided that it wasn't really profitable to make Looney Tunes anymore, so they closed up Warner Brothers Animation. However, they changed their mind not too long after and wanted to make some Looney Tunes shorts, but the problem was there wasn't Warner Brothers Animation anymore, so they had to outsource them to the brand new DePatty Freeling Enterprises. If that name sounds familiar to you, aside from being recognized as the people that destroyed Looney Tunes, they're also known for making the Pink Panther cartoons. I, for one, was never really big on those. They're just kinda eh to me, but I understand that a lot of people like them, so if you're one of those people, good for you. You keep doing you, all right? So now it was up to them to make Looney Tunes in the 1960s, but right away that became a big task. Not only did DePatty and Freeling have to live up to the lofty expectations that come with the names Looney Tunes and Merry Melodies, but they also had a tiny fraction of the budget. They weren't given nearly enough to make these cartoons work. That, and they also weren't given the rights to use half the cast. In fact, Bugs Bunny, Warner Brothers' mascot and easily one of the most popular and most successful cartoon characters ever, was not licensed to DePatty Freeling. That means they had to make do with what they had. Most notably, the Roadrunner, Wile E. Coyote, Daffy Duck, and Speedy Gonzalez. Okay, well, I'm sure you can make some good shorts with those four. Obviously, everyone loves the Roadrunner Coyote shorts. They're some of the best, right? Not here. Here, there's a bunch of animation errors, the gags are repetitive, and sometimes even stolen from other shorts. It all feels really off and surprisingly boring. That is something I never thought I would use to describe a Looney Tunes cartoon, but here we go. They're dull as dirt. The Speedy Gonzales and Daffy Duck shorts are not much better. In fact, I dare even say they're worse. And I'm not saying that the Daffy Duck cartoons and the Speedy cartoons are bad. I'm saying the Daffy and Speedy cartoons are bad. Yeah, they share cartoons now. They are now arch enemies. Sylvester, I guess, wasn't really available. He did appear every so often, but... Not a whole lot. For the most part, it's Daffy trying to hunt Speedy. Yeah, everyone knows about nature's arch enemies. The mongoose and the snake, the lion and the gazelle, the duck and the mouse. 
On paper, these sound bad. Daffy chasing Speedy and a really slow and dull series of Roadrunner and Coyote shorts. But they get way, way worse. Since the budget was on par of something like Hanna-Barbera, which, by the way, they used a lot of Hanna-Barbera sound effects in these shorts, they couldn't really do a whole lot and they had to cut corners wherever they could. This means that they had to stray away from the animation being the main focus and have it be a dialogue-based show, and that doesn't really work. Especially because they don't replace the visual gap with dialogue gags, instead they replace it with the characters talking, and that's all. One of the worst examples I can think of is Assault and Peppered, where most of the short is just Daffy and Speedy yelling at each other with the occasional half quip. It's not enough of a quip to really be a joke, but it's trying, I guess? Now let's call a spade a spade here. This is pure, unabashed filler. This has no purpose aside from dragging out the already short runtime. In fact, in one of the shorts, Well Worn Daffy, it takes four minutes for a visual joke to actually happen. Four minutes. Now, I'm not one of those people that has a crazy short attention span and can't focus on anything unless there's something zipping by, but again, it's Looney Tunes. It sets up a certain expectation and it doesn't follow through. Another way that they cut corners is by having a lot of the impacts happen off screen. Once again, in Assault and Peppered, most of the time when Daffy is hit by the cannons, it's off screen, and then we see what happens afterwards, and even then he's barely scuffed. I guess that's because designing a crazily deformed Daffy would have taken too much time and money. Oh gosh, it's like that episode of Garfield and Friends where Aloysius keeps cutting everything because they don't have any money. Oh no. Now I think I know what it's based on. There's another one I want to point to, and that's Sugar and Spies. One of the most repetitive, flat Roadrunner cartoons I have ever seen. There's one scene where Wiley e. Coyote wants to mail a bomb to Roadrunner, only for Roadrunner to mail it right back. This joke should probably take about 15 to 20 seconds, right? Well, it takes about double that, and you feel every second. And also, you don't get to see the payoff. It happens off screen. Because of this and the lackluster animation, the jokes don't land. If you don't see the effect, the misery doesn't really resonate, therefore it's not funny. Also, when there's things like Daffy getting hit on the head or something, it doesn't land because it's not cartoony enough. This is what I would call under animation, where it moves to the bare minimum so it doesn't become something like Patty the Pelican or Clutch Cargo. As a result, everything feels really stiff and weightless. None of the impacts have an effect. You know what this reminds me of? It reminds me of those famous cartoons Popeye shorts. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, the exact same thing happened to Popeye. Popeye is known for its quick, zany animation, and famous studios had basically none of that. Whatever little it did have was stiff and slow, and therefore not nearly as entertaining as the original shorts. Also, it filled a lot of it up with dialogue and facial reactions, and that just wasn't the Popeye style. Although I will say, they at least tried a lot more than the Looney Tunes cartoons did in the 1960s, so at least there's that. And if you guys want us to cover Popeye, we actually have it on our list of things that we want to do. So, who knows? It could actually happen. Fingers crossed, right? Eventually, DePatty and Freeling knew that these shorts were big flops. They had to change things up. And change them up, they did. They ended up making some of their own original characters, like Bunny and Claude, or Cool Cat. No, 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 not that cool cat. This cool cat. He's basically the Pink Panther who talks. That's not just my interpretation, that's how people at the time saw him too. None of these characters stuck. They were not popular in the slightest. And because no one wanted to see any cartoons starring these nobodies, that was it. They couldn't keep going anymore because everyone knew all the problems. Why would you seek these things out if you knew they were going to fail? It also didn't help that they kept stealing jokes and stories from the original cartoons, which begs the question, if you're gonna keep going back to the old stuff, why make new stuff at all? An argument that's still going on to this day, by the way. These shorts were failures, we can all admit that. But I will say, it could have been worse. They could have gotten Gene Deitch, who made a lot of those really bad Tom and Jerry cartoons. Or even worse than those, the Hanna-Barbera ones. Which, speaking of those, there's this really bad one called Go For It Tom that made me laugh really hard. 
There's this character, the gopher, that talks, and sometimes his mouth doesn't move at all. It just hangs open and words come out. That's the kind of quality we're dealing with, folks. There's been some people out there who said, you can't be too hard on the 1960s Looney Tunes cartoons. They were doing the best with what they had. That doesn't mean they're good, though. Just because you're trying to fix a leaky pipe with bubble gum doesn't mean that you're trying your best. It means that you can't do the job with what you have. I get that they didn't have a lot of characters, but still, having Daffy try to chase Speedy, and him going from a screwball egotist to Yosemite Sam, basically, that doesn't work. It sounds really eerie hearing Daffy say all these crazy things about how much he wants to kill Speedy, and having him do things that Daffy really shouldn't do. The Looney Tunes cartoons never really had super strong characters. However, they did have a basic outline for how they're supposed to act. Taz is supposed to be wild and insatiable, Bugs is a smart aleck, overconfident, pompous guy, Daffy is really full of himself and is not afraid of showing it, all that sort of stuff. And surprisingly, even though these characters are really, really basic, they still managed to break every single one of them. The closest one they got right was Speedy, but even then, he has a lot less personality now than he did back then. He's just kind of there. And yes, they even mess up the Roadrunner. The Roadrunner has never really been my favorite character. I've personally always rooted for the Coyote. It runs in the family. But one of the main rules of the old Roadrunner shorts was that the Roadrunner never really knew that the Coyote was trying to get him. Or if that, he was just trying to keep himself alive. He was never really antagonistic. However... In the 1960s Looney Tunes cartoons, he is actively trying to get the coyote. It's not like an aforementioned mongoose snake kind of thing, it's just the roadrunner trying to hurt the coyote. Again, the blissfully ignorant character now becomes a jerk. Now I really want that coyote to catch the roadrunner. And with the terrible quality of all these things tarnishing the Looney Tunes brand, it was over. The last theatrical Looney Tunes cartoon would be released, and then no more would be made. Sadly, Cool Cat would be the last Looney Tunes character to get a theatrical short. Oh, joy. And even then, if we're going by the original characters, you know, the ones people actually liked, it was arguably one of the worst, where Speedy and Daffy go back in time to the time of the gladiators. Hijinks do not ensue. Can I really be that mad at this era of Looney Tunes when they're just boring and mediocre? Yes because that's not what we've come to expect from the brand. They should have known better that this would not work. Especially because these were made to try to get the audience back. So let me get this straight. To try to entice people to go away from the TV sets and to seek your shorts out in the movie theaters, what you're doing is making a half-baked, low-budget, inferior version of your product? To this day, this is regarded as the worst period of time for Looney Tunes content. And yeah, the 70s were a little rough too, but the 60s? They were the worst. The Looney Tunes have moved on to new things now, but no matter what, this dark age will always haunt them, and it will always be a part of who they are. Whether they want to admit it or show it on TV, or not. Well folks, thanks for watching the video. What'd you guys think? Have you seen any of these shorts? What do you think of them? What do you think is the worst Looney Tunes cartoon ever? Theatrically speaking, of course, we're only going by those ones. Comment below and let me know because I'm always excited to hear what you guys have to say. Today's comment of the day goes to Ivo Agate Robotnik. Happy 8K. You've done really well. Keep making your videos amazing. That's just basically summarizing it. But yes, thank you so much. 8K, it still doesn't feel right. And here we are at the 7K video, so that means next month, it's the 8K. But again, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're gonna say it until the words lose all meaning. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Real quick, I'd like to thank our Patreon executive producers, Reziel, Leaf Razor, Azarius, Michaela Bellamy, Whoopdo, and MD the Dude. If you two would like your name read at the end of every Media Mementos video, then consider donating to our Patreon, which, by the way, has a link in the description below. Thanks for watching, and once again, thank you for 7,000 subscribers. It's a real honor, and we'll see you guys next time!